This week, Itai Tavet from Intezer is with us to discuss AI and the autonomous SOC. Then Justin Beals from StrikeGraph joins us to talk about approaches to cybersecurity, new approaches to cybersecurity and compliance. Finally, in the enterprise security news, Upwind Security gets a massive $100 million Series B, TrustWave and CyberReason merge, NVIDIA wants to force SOC analyst millennials to socialize with AI agents, has the cybersecurity workforce peaked, why incident response is essential for resilience, an example of good product marketing, who moves Skynet? It's a mystery. All that and more in this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production for security professionals by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. It's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. Big ID is the leading data security posture management or DSPM vendor, and they do DSPM differently. DSPM centers around risk management and how organizations need to assess, understand, identify, and remediate data security risks across their data. Big ID seamlessly integrates with your existing tech stack and helps you uncover dark data, identify and reduce risk, take action through remediation, and scale your data security strategy. Big ID is reshaping the future of data security, and CB Insights named Big ID the leader in DSPM and the most disruptive cybersecurity software in the space. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Big ID to learn more. Greylog elevates enterprise level cybersecurity through its comprehensive SIM, centralized log management, and API security solutions. Built on the Greylog platform, Greylog Security combines SIM, security analytics, threat detection, and incident response capabilities. Unlike traditional SIMs, which offer complex and costly setups, Greylog Security simplifies security and operational challenges with an optimal blend of licensing, people, and infrastructure costs. To see a demo, visit securityweekly.com forward slash gray log. Welcome to Enterprise Security Weekly and happy National Spicy Guacamole Day. This is episode 384, recorded on Thursday, November 14th, 2024. I'm your host, Adrian Sanabria, and joining me is the Admiral of ASPM, the Captain of Content, Katie Teitler Santulo. How are you doing, Katie? I am well. How are you? I'm doing great. I, uh, I had some happy distractions here, uh, just adding a, a last minute news story here that we'll talk about in the, the news segment. Was it spicy like guacamole? It, it was spicy, uh, like my guacamole. My guacamole is spicy uh, and it is highly, highly sought after. Yeah, so I had to choose guacamole for today because uh, I regularly get uh, requests for me to make my guacamole, which is a, a recipe I've been working on. Yeah, then it only makes sense that your news stories are also spicy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so today's topic is AI and the autonomous socks, separating hype from reality. We're excited to have Itai Tevet, CEO and co-founder of Intezer with us today. Itai co-founded Intezer in 2016 with a mission to, to research and develop technologies to transform the way that we investigate and respond to cybersecurity incidents. Welcome, Itai. Hi. Thank you for having me. Um, guacamole commonly found uh, where, where you are? Is, is that a, uh, I, I don't know what condiments uh, and dips have made it to, to different parts of the world. <laughs> yeah, uh, we have a lot of borders here in Israel, uh, but none is, is, is Mexi with Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll take that as a positive sign. Uh, okay. that, that you can hopefully find some good good guacamole there on spicy guacamole day. All right, so so jumping into it, um, yeah, I've had some exposure to uh, Intezer. I think they've actually sponsored this show in, in the. You guys have sponsored this show in the past, and uh, you know, m maybe catch us up with uh, with what you guys are are focusing on. Now, just kind of at a, at a high level, because there's a lot going on in this market right now. Right. Yeah. It, and it can be very confusing. Uh, but at a high level, uh, I think what we're mostly focused on is uh, 
that we we created something that emulates the human decision making uh, of a SOC analyst uh, and how they investigate alerts and make decisions. That's really our major breakthrough in the last uh, two years or so. Gotcha. And I, I know there, there's, you know, so one of the main things we're going to be talking about today is is what this technology really can and can't do. And I think even more importantly, uh, you know, a lot of us who have done automation and have done incident response work, uh, th- this kind of work, uh, I think a lot of times we look at these AI, AI demos like, uh, you know, spoiler for the news segment, we're going to be talking about uh, one of NVIDIA's demos in, in this area. And everybody who has this background watches that demo and thinks that's a three line Python script. You, you don't need a 3D avatar or an LLM or any of this stuff to make that happen. That, that's like, like I don't want to be too hard on it because it, it is just a demo, uh, you know, but, you know, I, th- I think that's fundamentally the thing here, like just because it's a new technology. Uh, you, you, do you get the sense as well that that people are using this technology for something that wasn't an unsolved problem. Like we can already do that today with existing machine learning or, or, or just basic automation techniques. Yeah, I think this is why it's very important kind of to separate the whole concept of autopilots, um, chatbots that help maybe to accelerate some of the questioning during a, an alert investigation, right? This is one thing which which is nice it's it's fine and of course if you have a 3d figure even better talking to you even better right <laughs> but i think that where the opportunity lies the most and where the the problem is and the pain is handling and triaging all the huge volume of alerts that uh come into a sock uh and it's still impossible to really automate that triage process uh, without having any human human in the loop at least with with traditional technologies uh, this is where i see the the bigger opportunity compared to you know uh, very very nice uh, buddy uh, ai buddy to help you uh, kind of ask questions faster get answers faster for for questions yeah, I, I mean, I think certainly uh, one of the things I'm most excited about is uh, replacing all the different query languages we have. You know, like Velociraptor has a query language and uh, like like each uh, log management or log correlation system has it or SIM has its own query language. Each uh, CMDB and asset management database and, and they're all kind of different and you have to know uh, you know, like the field names or something like that. You have to know, you know, what they, what they, is it IP address, one word, IP underscore address? Like what, what is the variable name? I don't remember. <laughs> uh, dest IP, destination underscore IP, right. DST IP. DST uh, or DEST? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so like using generative AI, uh, to figure that part out, like let it figure out if it's a three letter, four letter acronym of, of destination. Uh, I, I, I love that, you know, like, like and it, again, like it seems to me just these little things, uh, they mean a lot. You know, I think they help a lot. I don't want to underscore, uh, you know, just by calling them little things, but uh, th- those small quality of life improvements, I think are a big deal and people get kind of caught up in, in, uh, you know, just making it seem more grand, I guess, than it than it really is. Uh, I, I think, but I think that you have a point. Essentially, uh, you know, again, helping uh, security analysts accelerating a bit their job with, for example, uh, you know, translating natural language to query language is, is definitely an, an improvement. But it's not, you know, it's it's not change a life changer for anybody. I th- uh, so again, and this is why. We're trying to focus in in our company, at least, on the earlier side of the of the funnel, where usually there are a lot of repetitive tasks that nobody likes to do, constantly yeah. chasing false positives and chasing ghosts. It's usually ninety five percent of the of the work, which again nobody likes to do. This is, I think, the bigger opportunity where it can make a big impact. And so before a human even uh, touches any of this data, right? 
Exactly. Imagine like, you know, uh, many, many companies are outsourcing their, their sock, you know, to somebody in the, in the cloud, right? Uh, uh, somebody in, an, in another company that takes all the volume of alerts and escalates only what matters back to your security team, right? So that, and, and again, th- those, um, the, those teams um, also have talent and resource shortages and nobody likes to do this repetitive task. So having an AI as an alternative to that can be very, very impactful. So, so would you call that kind of work uh, triage work? Uh, you know, th- this yeah. kind of routing of information, determining if it's worth spending time on? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's triage. Some people call it, you know, the tier one or L1 SOC tasks. I've noticed some companies, uh, you know, companies in this category, you know, that that are looking to use generative AI to, um, you know, reduce the the work here, increase the response uh, speed, typically fall into two buckets. Uh, there are those that say, yes, we're going to replace uh, people. You know, we're going to replace potentially like the aim is to replace that entire layer uh, that we really shouldn't have humans doing that. The work sucks. They don't want to do it. Uh, you know, it, it, it uh, takes too long for a human to do it. Uh, and then the other bucket, uh, there are folks saying, Hold, you know, very careful to say, no, we're not going to replace any people. This is just a uh, an assistant tool. You know, so so. Uh, I mean, I, I, I guess I, you know, maybe those are two different categories of products that I'm that I'm thinking of. There uh, is is that what's happening here? I think that it's it's really uh, a matter of uh, different products for different pain points. Again, one pain point is, hey, I have an alert that I know is already escalated. It's a real thing, but now I need to accelerate my uh, time. Investigation. Exactly. And then there's the other part, which is, oh, I'm flooded with thousands of alerts, which I need to triage. Mm. How do I even get to that point? By by the way, reduction. Yes, uh, reduction. And, you know, uh, we take even for granted the fact that most uh, security teams have to make the compromise of only looking at high severity alerts critical severity alerts and just, you know, any low, lower signal, medium severity, just as being un- underlooked, again, not, not best practice uh, uh, for sure. So I think it's just different two pain points uh, to talk about. And, and, and which of these are, are you going after here? Are you going after both or is it mainly the noise reduction piece of it? So our, our, our platform uh, uh, aims to uh, cover both, however, focus by far on the uh, alert triage automation problem uh, by far because, because we believe that's the bigger point, uh, pain point. And, the, and helping with the deeper investigation is a bit more of a, of a nice to have. So I have a, a quick question for you because, you know, I, I'm listening to everything you say and it all rings so true. And when I'm talking to people, you know, it's the, the alert overload. It's people doing manual work that is really low level, hyper repetitive. But at the same time, there seems to be a bit of a reluctance for certain types of practitioners to fully hand things over. So how are you overcoming that with your prospects and, and, you know, other potential either buyers or partners or whomever? That's the biggest challenge. By the way, I think that it's not just in in the security industry, but generally speaking, you know, if you look at AI for software engineers and AI for marketers, people, uh, you know, have this kind of trust, uh, uh, challenge that they need to to overcome, and of course we'll see it uh, gradually becoming more of a more of a thing, right? But the way that we're we're trying to remediate that concern is is simply uh, you know we let people just test drive our, our solution, see the results, and then suddenly it's the the concerns are are much lower. And I always remind our customers and prospects that. What you're looking for is 
at least as good as what you would expect from humans to do, right? Uh, it's not perfect, but also humans are not perfect. So as long as it's a bit better, a bit faster, a bit more accurate, but it can be done in scale automatically, you know, this is just a huge uh, pain reliever. Yeah, it, it is. But the skepticism, you know, I think that's ingrained in in us. And like you said, it's not just security people, but you know, it's a hard, hard battle to overcome. And your space is getting very crowded very quickly, as I'm sure you and your team are aware. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. And, and, you know, this is part of the market tailwinds that also help us in, in a way because, you know, CISOs nowadays are being hammered about, hey, what are you doing in order to leverage AI to make your team better, more efficient. So, so they, you know, we start to see a shift in the market where people are, you know, uh, uh, giving more trust than they used to. I, I do kind of worry about that pressure, though the the pressure to just use a technology, you know, with without first asking the question, is this something that would be useful? Like, I feel like that needs to be the first question. But uh, to your point. Uh, you know, th this is a, a general technology, you know, that has a uh, applicability in a lot of different places. What, what are some of the, do you see people going after something you, you consider it to be a bad use for? Have you seen cases or, or maybe in your own testing before you settled on, on these areas where you are using it? Uh, did you find some areas where it, it's just didn't work out? Uh, what wasn't, uh, wasn't useful and, and maybe you recommend not using it. Absolutely. Um, well, the question is, what is it? It, it if we're talking about, you know, uh, yeah, large yeah, language AI. models, yeah, generative mm -hmm. AI, for sure. Generative AI is extremely good at certain things and extremely bad at other things. Uh, uh, it's very good at analyzing text and text-based evidence and artifacts like, logs and, and command lines and maybe email bodies. It sucks at so many other things such as critical thinking. And, you know, you can, you can, you can, uh, ask chat GPT if a URL is malicious, <laughs> it won't really know it, it, it will hallucinate. Right. So, yeah. so the, our uh, thesis is really to use AI and LLMs as a tool in the tool in our tool belt in order to reach the ultimate goal, which is to emulate what a human analyst would do. And, and part of it might be using their own eyes, which, which LLMs are very good at kind of mimicking the human understanding and, and the eye of looking at text, but then uh, also using other tools and other technologies to uh, uh, encompass what a human would do in a certain scenario, how they would investigate an alert, for example. Um, yeah, so... We eliminate tier one of the SOC, you know, say we get to that goal, you and, and several others are, are aiming for that. Um, you know, on the one hand, that, that's great. Nobody wants to do this job anyway. Uh, in fact, one of my concerns uh, before we even got to large language models uh, being able to do this kind of thing uh, was that the, we had a lot of people entering the industry doing what I viewed as one of the worst jobs you could do in the industry. You know, very concerned about burning people out, turning people away from the industry at that entry level role. At the same time, um, if if the sock <laughs> isn't where you enter the industry, you know, if if we kind of take away that job because it, it was a fairly simple job, you know, that that's why we were putting people there to begin with. Uh, where do we put them? I th this is a very good question, and I think that honestly. Um, this, this is such a big question for the entire industry as a whole. Think about junior marketers, junior software engineers, uh, junior salespeople. Uh, usually their entry point is literally can be replaced with even just generative AI. I actually think that for a SOC, it's a bit more comp complex because I don't think it can be replaced by just wrapping chat GPT around uh, an API, like it can't be done. But for so many jobs, 
uh, the entry level roles will look very, very different in 2027, 2026. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. I think that we'll need uh, much more maturity in, in training for somebody to actually come into many, many tech technology fields. And one of the one of the things, uh, you know, going back to kind of the technology and, and how we make this work. Uh, one of the things that I, I think has always been challenging and has always been kind of a failing of the sim, as we've seen different generations of the sim through the ages. You know, it's always pull all your data into this one place and we'll do all this cool correlations and pull insights out and, and stuff like that. I feel like we never really got to that. You know, in fact, when when we saw SOAR uh, gain speed, you know, a lot of what SOAR was about was this kind of very static uh, relationship between two different data sets, this kind of, uh, uh, you know, very basic uh, uh, attempt to correlate things. Uh, you know, I imagine you do kind of run up, run up against this problem with what you're doing. How, how do you, you know, how, how do you address that challenge uh, where maybe it's not just a single, uh, you know, data source, maybe you do have to correlate a couple things uh, together uh, to, to be able to validate something. Is, is that, uh, again, is that something that you're doing with a combination of uh, rules that you build and the LLM? Or, you know, does the LLM offer some magic here that makes this easier? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. So, Really, our North Star is thinking about what a human analyst would do in order to investigate alert. And usually it's, it goes through a certain process of, you know, taking once they get an alert, they, inv they collect any associated evidence and then they try to uh, correlate and analyze each and every piece of evidence with multiple different technologies and then taking all the investigation results and crunching it down to a bottom line decision that happens in our brain, is it a false positive or should be, should it be escalated and so on? Mm -hmm. And yes, uh, we since we follow that kind of process, which again is not just LLMs. Actually, I think that maybe thir maybe thirty to twenty percent is 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 LLMs. The right is the the rest is other technologies. Um, in order to really uh, uh, correlate things, but it's very different from getting a, you know, millions of logs and trying to create a signal. That's something that Sim already is doing, uh, not in the best way to your point, but, but, uh, but we're, rep we're trying to replicate what already goes to a, to a, to a tier one stock analyst. Gotcha. Gotcha. So 70% Panda and Python. And <laughs> yeah, it tends to be like when you look under the covers of something, you're like, oh, no, it's all Python. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I, I just feel like that's. Um, um, but yeah, I imagine that, um, you know, as you and I'm looking at the list of different integrations that you support here, and it's 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 a pretty big list. Um, you know, that, that there is some significant work uh, to add each of these these integrations and make sure it works with that workflow that you've built. Yeah, um, I think that once we cover a certain type of alert, let's say endpoint or cloud or identity, there are some repetitive things. Right. Each EDR one is very similar, right? Exactly, or, exactly. You, you know, the, the phishing uh, enrichment uh, exactly. or something like that. Yeah. You would investigate an alert from CrowdStrike very similarly to how you would investigate an alert from Sentinel One, for example. And, and kind of to that point, uh, or to Katie's point earlier, <clears throat> is the you know when when people are initially trying to build that trust uh, with a product like this, uh, how transparent is it you know for them to dig into and understand why the LLM chose to go one direction or another? This is key, you know, and, and you know, I, I forgot to mention it, uh, but this is a very important point to, to Katie's question. Uh, transparency, like not feeling that it's a black box. And by the way, this is one of the main pain points that we hear from customers is that when when they outsource a SOC, especially, they feel like, you know, I don't I, 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 I can't trust what they're doing because I don't know what they're doing, what is the investigation process. So being like an 
open, uh, open book and say, okay, this is why we came to that conclusion. And here's all the checks and evidence that we have collected and analyzed in order to make uh, a decision. It's, it's critical to gain trust. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think we've all heard some variation of stories uh, in MSSP that comes in and they plug in their black box IDS or something like that. And then you find out years later, it was never plugged into the correct port and they weren't seeing the network traffic, you know, but only during an incident do you find out, oh, they've got nothing to help you out with because uh, there was never anything to begin with. So, yeah, like, like it's more than I think it's more than trust, too. It's it's some kind of validation that, um, you know, it, it, it is seeing what you intend it to see. Uh, yeah, because I imagine a lot of these integrations, uh, you know, the, you can filter. Uh, the data that an integration is allowed to see. It's not just a, a straight uh, fire hose, of, or maybe it is for some of these vendors, but, uh, you know, I imagine others, uh, you can choose what gets shared in that in, in that integration. So do you think there's a role in there for almost um, somebody to watch the watchers? You know, we're talking about certain roles going away, but as technology changes, it seems to me like this would be a good opportunity to get, you know, to, to onboard certain types of people to get familiar with it. Is is that happening? Is that ideal? You know, how do you see it from your implementations? Yeah, so if I understand your question correctly, basically, in a sense, this is kind of done even today Um in, in, in socks, even regardless of, of AI powered socks, because essentially the, the later tiers, the more senior analysts are kind of verifying the escalations that they got from the, uh, the, the previous tier. I expect this to happen also, you know, with, with a, with any AI sock, uh, any alert that is escalated by a, by the AI will be, you know, uh, closely, <laughs> closely verified and monitored. Yes, until there's enough water under the bridge that somebody says, "All right, we can we can stop the twenty four seven watching." Um, maybe we go to you know twenty seven. Yeah. <laughs> Never completely stop watching. Well, that's why I went. I went, you know instead of twenty four seven, twenty seven, eighteen seven. I don't know. <laughs> I, I was going to say, you know, we're we're hearing. You know, naturally, you're going to change out models as you go along. Maybe a model is, uh, you know, cheaper to run or it's more effective, you know, but but uh, I do find it interesting that we are, I assume this would happen sooner rather than later. Uh, sounds like we're, we're kind of hitting the limits uh, of what's effective, you know, without hallucination and, and bringing in other things, you know, and just in general from the large language model uh, industry. Yeah, I, I mean... I honestly, I think that it's, it's so, it's, it's just, it's just the beginning. I think, I, I think that at the end of the day, this is such a new, new technology. I know obviously a lot of people have been working on it for a long, long time. And then suddenly OpenAI decides to release it to the public and uh, it kind of sparked the interest of uh, that race that we see right now, the tech race that we see right now. But I think that uh, the sky is the limit and we don't even know what will happen a year from now. It's hard to tell. But regarding the 24 seven, like watch. So think of like, if you remember like uh, tw uh, 15 years ago, there were like uh, teams, like IT teams that monitor like downtimes on systems. And today it's, it's like uh, just a, like a pager duty uh, on call. Uh, I think that we'll see something similar in the sock space where, you know, they, they do uh, uh, go to sleep, but they have their on call and the AI kind of watches over, over the, the, the fort uh, overnight. Yeah, I've heard humans, uh, even after 40 years, never fully get used to third shift. Uh, so having something that can do run that third shift for us, uh, you know, I think that's that's great. Sleep hygiene is important. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so so uh, maybe one of the last questions here, you know, I think it's clear that uh, AI in its current form is not a 10x engineer and it's not probably not even going to turn people into 10x engineers. You know, so w what are some of the if you don't mind sharing uh what what are some of the real 
world, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you have a way to measure this, but the, the amount of labor, you know, the amount of work, uh, that this is potentially saving people, uh, what, what, what does that mm -hmm. actually yeah. look like? So I, I, can, I can attest, like, from our customer uh, base, this is really what I can really measure. So on average, we escalate about 4% of alerts uh, back, to the, back to the team. So that's quite a significant re reduction. We get, like, 100% of alerts and only 4% are, are, are escalated. Uh, and then among those 4%, Usually the investigation is also accelerated because you have all the context of the previous investigation done on screen. So, yeah, this is this is quite a force multiplier. Great. Uh, Itai, thank you so much for joining us on Enterprise Security Weekly today. I I'm really glad that we got to have this conversation. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure being on. And stay tuned. When we come back, we're going to talk new approaches to compliance with Justin Beals from StrikeGraph. <laughs> 